Bien, en el vídeo de hoy vamos a ver al equipo de OpenAI que están hablando de O1 y bueno, están todos los miembros que han participado en el desarrollo, así que tienen bastantes cosas interesantes como por qué lo han hecho, qué hace, así que veamos el vídeo. I'm Bob McGrew. I lead the research team here at OpenAI. We've just released a preview of our new series of models, O1 and O1 Mini, which we are very excited about. And we've got the whole team here to tell you about them. What exactly is O1? So we're starting a series of new models uh, with the new name O1. This is to highlight the fact that you might feel different uh, when you use uh, O1 as a, compared to previous models uh, such as GPT-40. As others will explain later, O1 is a reasoning model, so it will think more before answering your question. We are releasing two models, O1 Preview, which is to preview what's coming for O1, and O1 Mini, which is a smaller and faster model that is trained with a similar framework as O1. So we hope you like our new naming scheme, O1. <laughs> so what, what is reasoning anyway? So one way of thinking of reasoning is that uh, there are times where we ask questions and we need answers immediately because they're simple questions. For example, if you ask what's the capital of Italy, you know the answer is Rome and you don't really have to think about it much. But if you um, wonder um, about a complex puzzle or you want to write a really good business plan, you want to write a novel, you probably want to think about it for a while. And the more you think about it, the better the outcome. So reasoning is the ability of turning thinking time into better outcomes, whatever the task you're doing. So how long have you guys been working on this? Early on at OpenAI, we were very inspired by the AlphaGo results and the potential of deep reinforcement learning. And so we were researching that heavily, and we saw great scaling on data and robotics. And we were thinking about how, 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 can, we, how can we do reinforcement learning on a general domain to get to a very capable artificial intelligence. And then we saw the amazing results of scaling and supervised learning in the GPT paradigm. And so ever since we've been thinking about how do we combine these two different paradigms into one. Yeah, and it's hard to point to one exact instance where this whole effort got started. But you know, we've had early explorations with uh, Jakob and Shimon. We've had early explorations with Lukash, Ilya. And of course, like I think one moment in time here is consolidating things with Jerry and um, having him build out this large scale effort here. So I mean, it's been going on for a long time. But I think what's really cool about research is there's that aha moment there's that particular point in time where something surprising happens and things really click together. Are there any times for you all when there was you had that aha moment? I could say <laughs> GPT-2, GPT-3, GPT-4. There was the first one I went around, was hot off the press. We started talking to the model. People were like, wow, this, this, this model is really great and starting doing, doing, doing something like that. And I think that there, there, there was a certain moment in our, in our training process where we trained like put more compute in our L than before and try and first of all generating coherent chains of thought. And we saw, wow, this, this looks like something meaningfully different than before. And I think, I think for, for me, this is the moment. Uh, wow. Related to that, so, uh, when we think about like training a model for reasoning, uh, one thing that immediately jumps to mind is you could have humans write out their thought process and train on that. One aha moment for me was like when we saw that when, if you train the model using RL to generate and hone its own chain of thoughts, it can do even better than having humans write chains of thought for it. And that was an aha moment that you could really scale this uh, and explore models reasoning that way. For a lot of the time that I've been here, we've been trying to make the models better at solving math problems, as an example, and we've put a lot of work into this, and we've come up with a lot of different methods, but one thing that I kept, like, every time I would read these outputs from the models, I'd always be so frustrated. The model just would never seem to question what was wrong or when it was making mistakes or things like that, but one of these early uh, O1 models, when we trained it and we actually started talking to it, we started asking it these questions, and it was scoring higher on these math tests we were giving it, we could look at how it was reasoning. Um, and you could just see that it started to question itself and have really interesting reflection. Um, and that was a moment for me where I was like, wow, like we've, we've uncovered something different. This is going to be something new. And, and it was just like one of these coming together moments that, that, that was really powerful. So when you, when you read the, the, the thoughts, do they, does it feel like you're watching a human or does it feel like you're watching a robot? It's like a spiritual experience. <laughs> <laughs> it's a spiritual experience, but then you can empathize with the model. You're like, oh, that's a mistake that a lot of people would make. Or you can see it sort of questioning common conventions. And 
Yeah, it, it's it's spiritual, but like oddly human in, in its behavior. <laughs> well, it, it was also pretty cool at some point when uh, when we have seen in cases where there was like a limited amount of thinking allowed for the model that just before the timeout, the model was like, oh, I'm like, I have to finish it now. And so I get oh, here is the answer. I spent a lot of time doing uh, competition math when I was young, and that was really my whole reason for getting into AI was to try and automate this process. And uh, so it's been very like a huge full circle moment for me to see the model actually be able to follow through like very close to the same steps I would use when solving these problems. Um, and that's you know it's not exactly the same chain of thought I would say, but very very relatable. It's also really cool to you know it's believable that these models they are getting on the cusp of really advancing engineering and science, and uh, if they seem to be like solving the problems hard, you know, maybe we can call ourselves experts hard for us, then maybe they will be even hard for some other experts and could advance science. So we've talked a lot about some of the, the great moments and the times that everything just clicked. What are some of the hurdles? What are some of the places where it was actually really hard to make things work? Training large models is fundamentally a very, very hard thing to do. <laughs> there are like thousands of things that can go wrong and there are, there are at least like hundreds that did go wrong in every, <laughs> every training run. So almost everyone here like, you know, put a lot of blood, sweat and tears in, in training those, the, 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 those things and figuring out how to, how, how to keep them continue learning and improving on a path that's actually the path of success is very narrow, and the ways of failure are plentiful. And it's like, uh, imagine like uh, having uh, the center for launching a rocket to the, let's say, some planet, moon or so, and if you are off by one angle, you won't arrive at the destination. And that's our job. <laughs> so, so the model, we said, is, is very good, oftentimes better than humans, like as equivalent of several PhDs, and that is sometimes a challenge because we have to often go and verify that the model isn't going off the rails, doing something so sensible, and it started taking some serious time as we scaled the model. Uh, we were saturating out all, all the industry uh, great evals, and we don't know what to look for next, so that is also a challenge. Yeah, I do think all of these things we ran into, it's also been one point of fulfillment. It's like, uh, you know, every time you have a puzzle, it's like another hurdle for this team to overcome, and I'm really glad with all of the little hurdles that we've so what, what are some of the ways you tested the models? Did you have any favorite questions that you saw the model get better at? How many hours are in short part? <laughs> <laughs> For whatever reason, the uh, chat GPT wasn't able to solve this question reliably. But oh one, like, you know, we did like a year and a half work, like a large work, and now we can count the number of hours in strawberry. <laughs> we should have just hard-coded that movie. That Reliably. <laughs> I have this habit, which I think other people here do too, of whenever you go on Twitter and you see some post that's like, large language models can't do this, you copy and paste it in and then you say, confirm that our large language models <laughs> uh, can do this. To give people a sense of what they can use the model for. I'd love to hear some of the ways that you use O1. So uh, one way I've been using O1 is for obviously coding and a lot of my job is about coding. So the uh, more and more I focus on the problem definition and use this what's called a TDD, test driven development. So instead of writing the code that implements the functionality, I focus on writing say the unit test that specify what is correct behavior of this piece of code to pass. And so, because I can focus on more of that and then pass it on to O1 to really implement the thing, I can focus on this, uh, what's important, what's the high level problem um, to solve and so on. So this has been really a uh, important way of shifting my focus. And another area is debugging. So now when I get some error messages, I just pass it to uh, O1 and then it just prints out something. Sometimes it's solved right away, even if it doesn't, it at least gives some better questions to ask and uh, provide some ways to think about this problem better. So it has been really important change of um, working uh, for me, and I hope this helps others too. I like using a lot more and more for learning. The more I ask it's like various complex technical subjects, I find hallucinate less and explain better those concepts on previous models. For me, I like to use O1 as like a brainstorming partner. So that can range from anything from like uh, how to solve some very specific ML problem, machine learning problem, to like how to write uh, a blog post or, or a tweet. So uh, for example, I, I recently wrote a blog post about language model evaluations. And I was asking Owan about 
ideas for the structure of the blog post, pros and cons of certain benchmarks, um, and even the style of the writing. And I think because it's able to think before it gives the final answer, um, it's able to connect ideas better, it can revise and uh, critique candidate ideas and, and things like that. Yeah, I think if you need like a, you know, you have some short text and you want it more creative, something really different, that that's a great use to like give me five different ideas. Also, if you have just sort of like some unstructured thoughts, it's a really brilliant thought partner. So you have like some ideas, it's like, well, how should I connect these things? What am I missing? Um, and through its final answers and through sort of reading its like thought process, it, it can really lead to like much better results for you. Yeah, I use it to try out a bunch of our internal secret ideas, and it actually tries to improve it. <laughs> yeah, for standalone projects, it's it's great. Like like I I I had to add the GitHub plugin. I know nothing about adding GitHub plugins, and I just said like, hey, I want GitHub plugin that displays this and this information about the PR, and 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 like um, yeah, just produce the code. I just like. Like, you know, I would just ask it, like, okay, so where do I need to paste this code? I don't even know. Like, uh, it's just like, yeah, you paste it here. Let's go. I think for a lot of people, it's, uh, it's hard to really feel the AGI until you see the models do something better than humans can at a domain that you really care about. And I think, you know, for Go players and chess players that would have come, you know, a few years earlier, and for a lot of us that, like, really value math and, and coding, I, I think we're starting to feel that now. I want moms to be proud of us. <laughs> <laughs> so are there any parts of this project, anything that, that really needed to be done, but you know, people might not realize how important it is? Yes, so I think building large-scale uh, reliable infrastructure for to run our biggest flagship, flagship model training runs, as well as doing research experiments, is something that is not as exciting as doing research itself, but has to be done, and it's has a tremendous impact on the success on the entire project. I think there is something special in OpenAI about how we structure our research and that we value algorithmic advancements in the same way as building reliable large-scale systems and building data sets that are needed either way for, for training those models. I'm really proud of OpenAI in that way. Yeah, I think that has been a consistent pattern throughout many of our big projects. Every time we scale a new thing up, another order of magnitude, we see another host of problems, both algorithmic and infrastructure, and we've definitely built a capacity to, to, to uh, advance them both with, with a lot of focus. I feel the final model is just like literally a beautiful piece of art, right? <laughs> In order to make it work, we have to make sure that every step has work, right? You know, we, we find some any challenge and we solve it, right? I think that's really how OpenAI operates, and I'm very proud to work right here. Yeah. And I also must say, there's like a really not only brilliant people are here, but also kind-hearted. It's just fun to me to work over here, and I'm grateful to my colleagues to, you know, code with me, per code with me, hang out with me, eat lunch with me. Okay. Bueno, os dejo el vídeo más abajo si queréis ver los minutos que faltan. Está muy, muy interesante que hayan puesto, pues bueno, es el equipo que, que ha trabajado. Muy interesante, vemos que aquí dijo nuestro amigo que él lo utilizaba sobre todo para programar. Es cierto que básicamente estos modelos pues, son el mayor asistente que puedes tener a la hora de, de programar y para mí sigue siendo uno de los usos del día a día que se le da. Pero bueno, habéis visto que otras personas han, han hecho otro tipo de ejemplos en los que cuáles puedes utilizar estos nuevos modelos y también han explicado pues, eh, qué es el razonamiento en su modelo. Como siempre, darle a like, comentar y nos vemos en el siguiente.